So the question is, do you kill your character or do you keep your character because you need some kind of character to interact in the world? No, you have to... I don't think you need to keep your character because you're not something separate from the character. So that you and the character, which one of the enlightened people, his name... Uh, David Hawkins... Yes, I always start to say Richard Dawkins, he's definitely not. <laughs> and then Stephen Hawkins, David Hawkins. And he had this beautiful statement for it. He said, I'm going to summarize in my words, but he said, the, the sense of self disengages from the, all the temporary and the permanence and the delusion things and latches onto the unconditioned that is unborn, undying, unchanging. That's the enlightenment. So, so the sense of self, let's go of this, and latches onto that. He said, but what's left over will continue to live and work and move around in the world. And he said, it's like a karmic wind-up toy. I thought that was so apt. It operates according to its karma, and its karma is just a mechanism of habits that have come from its experiences. So. You can leave it carrying on by itself. You don't need to worry about it. You don't need to kill it off. But the point is that this character, you have so, so much investment into it. It's so easily absorbed into the things that it thinks, things that it says, things that it does, things that it wants. And that was tangled you up. So the sense of your being withdraws from that and turns around and latches onto that simple awake presence. That awake presence, awareness, it isn't enlightenment, but that's the stepping stone to enlightenment. That's why it's our practice, it's not our goal. As you withdraw and turn around, you just associate yourself much more with that silent, simple, aware presence. And you associate yourself far less with the character. Your character will get on and do stuff, don't worry, it will do stuff when it needs to. I first really hit this when I was doing the Douglas Harding practice. Has anyone done Douglas Harding here? It was you I was talking to about it, right? Anyone else? The man with no head? Uh, look him up, it's quite interesting. There's a certain way of understanding and a certain practice, but his main teaching was, I have no head. And so when I look at my experience, I have a body, that does stuff, but I don't have a head. And my body is upside down. Did you ever notice this? That your body is the other way up to everybody else's body? You're looking at me. <laughs> it's, probably <laughs> it's probably too much to go into. <sighs> okay. So lean back a little bit. You put your hands up here and you bring them down slowly in front of your eyes and you'll notice that they touch everybody's head keep bringing it down before they touch everybody's feet correct? keep bringing it down, keep bringing it down and then what happens, it touches your feet and then the body and then the rest of you which means your feet are up here but everybody else's feet are that way up you are the wrong way up Now, this isn't just philosophy. <laughs> Look up Douglas Harding, he's got all kinds of stuff up there. It's not just philosophy. This really ties you into this feeling of experiencing rather than being a doer, you're an experiencer. And you experience your hands doing things. It's most remarkable. I really first had this, I was driving my car. I was going to work, which is about a 15 minute drive. And I didn't want to get to work, because I don't like it. And so I said to myself, a little practice that I've been doing since I was a kid, long before I knew about meditation, I'd say, what if this moment never ended? And I'd walk along a wall and just pretend that that wall was infinite. And my mind would kind of just stop. And I don't know why I did that. I used to do that a lot. So then I was driving my car and I thought, well, I don't want to get to work, God, uh, thought, well, what if I just, this drive is just infinite. And that, that second my mind stopped still, totally still. 
And I saw my hands doing things like this, indicating changing gear, changing gear again, steering, indicating window washer, lights. I was like, my God, my hands are just like doing stuff. And then I noticed my feet going like this on the brake, and I was like, oh my God, my feet are just moving by themselves. And then I started to worry like, what if I'm not in control? What if I'm going to crash the car? And at that moment, all the self stuff came back up again. But just for that moment, I glimpsed myself in beautiful, smooth operation, but without a me being present doing anything. And I'm still doing my stuff. So that happened when I, in the driving the car, not long after I started meditating. Later on, I was in the monastery and I was walking along a, living in the monastery, I was walking along a bank above a dry, dryish stream. There was an old, it's like an oxbow lake, if you know what those are. So it was a kind of muddy thing at the bottom, not very deep or deadly, but it was 30 feet down. And it would be very unpleasant if I was to slip down that 30 feet and end up in a bog. That, that wouldn't have been very pleasant. And I was walking along the top of this bank, which is a very narrow path, because I'm like that. I wouldn't just walk around the bottom. And I slipped, and I went flying down the bank. Now my mind has one story, but my experience has a different story. My mind story is I went down that, as I was slipping down the bank, I turned around and I grabbed all of a tree to stop myself going down the bank. That's my mind story. My experience was totally different. My experience was, uh, and by the time I said, uh, I look up and there's my hand holding onto this tree trunk. It stopped me falling down this very unpleasant, slippery slope. Well, I didn't do that. My body did that. I wasn't doing it. I wasn't in control. And the next thing that happened, my mind said, I'm glad I caught the tree. But you didn't do anything. You were too busy going, uh? <laughs> you didn't do anything. You're just a commentator that comes along after the event that says, well, I did this and I did that. No, you didn't. You lying bastard. <laughs> and it's that moment that I really got this insight that my mind is just not honest. I don't know if it's deluded or it's dishonest. So I started to practice with this, and one of the, my duties in the temple at that time was I was making breakfast. And I thought, I wonder if I can make breakfast for the monastery without making breakfast for the monastery. So I propelled my body down the stairs, and then I just left it. And you know what happened? My body started whizzing around the kitchen, making the tea, making the porridge, washing the, getting the pots, getting the plates. I was like, oh my God, it's just doing it all by itself. So you read some of these enlightened mystics and they say that you can function perfectly without a self present. I know that's absolutely true. This is a particular practice from Douglas Harding, would really encourage this kind of perception. I, I don't work with that anymore. I work more with beautiful mind states is my current theme. but. Yes, so you don't need to kill your character off. Leave it. It will, it will do what it needs to do. It will keep yourself going. But your sense of association is not tangled up with it. It's back with the source, the awareness. <clears throat>